well be uh, LPR. Ron, now, uh, it's really more I hate to interrupt yeah. you. I don't see your slides advancing. At least I'm, I'm, so, so I'm on the third slide that says clinical presentation of LPR. You're not seeing that? I'm still seeing your first slide, your introduction slide. Uh, anybody? Okay, so what, is there something that I've got to do that's different than just moving the slides? Let me see, try this. Did that work? Somebody else chime in. Are other people seeing the slides advance? No, it's still the first slide. All right, it's still the first. Ah. So it's advancing on my screen. Now there's something up here that says screen sharing is paused. Can you um, close and uh, share your desktop again? Change, has that changed anything? No, it's still the first slide, Ron. I think when you hit share screen, it shares your desktop. And then when you hit the slideshow presentation, you have to share the slideshow which is a different desktop. So I think you have to share, go back to the share screen and then select a different, uh, different desktop to share. So you're not seeing it move. Actually, now I'm not seeing it move. Uh, let's see. Can you, how about that? Did that move it? Yes. 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 Okay. Sorry. 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 Okay. So this is the slide that I thought I was on, okay. uh, the clinical presentations of LPR, and you could see all of these. And again, they're just the most common things that we see, um, post-nasal drip and coughing and, uh, again, nasal congestion can be part of a eustachian tube dysfunction, sore throat. Um, but besides these upper respiratory tract complaints, oh, one, one thing that's really key, um, we see chronic or intermittent laryngitis. If you see somebody who has a hoarse voice and um, it changes over time where they'll tell you like at one point, this could be in one of your allergy sufferers as well, there's no reason why this condition can't go along with being allergic. Um, you'll see somebody who says, at some point, nobody can even hear me say anything. And then a few days later, I have my full voice. And then maybe a few days later, I'm hardly getting words out. You know, if you think about it, there's no other cause of intermittent hoarseness. If you catch a cold in your horse, your horse. If you have a vocal cord polyp, vocal cord tumor, you're going to get progressive hoarseness. If you have vocal cord paralysis, it's going to be stable. Um, but nobody kind of goes back and forth between perfectly good voice and then a hoarse voice and then no voice. So it's really a great diagnostic uh, tool for this condition. But even more important than the upper respiratory tract complaints, there's a whole variety of other things that people can get. Um, I want to go to this slide because this actually is an updated slide. Um, you can get asthma from this. You know, you, you're all probably really familiar with the New England Journal article a few years ago where they said that GERD was not a cause of um, uncontrolled or difficult to control asthma. Um, but they were really talking about GERD and not LPR. And LPR definitely is associated with really potentially severe asthma. But even what you know we all call idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis isn't really so idiopathic. Multiple studies showing that these people are actually having LPR. And then once it gets up into their oropharynx and goes back down by the laws of gravity, yeah, it can go back down in their esophagus and gets back into their stomach. Who cares? But it's got a 50-50 chance of hitting the vocal cords. That's how you get intermittent hoarseness. And if it gets through the vocal cords, it's now in your lungs and you can get bronchiectasis. You can get pulmonary fibrosis. You can get aspiration pneumonia. You can get all these different things, asthma. And also what I see a lot of, and I'm sure you see a lot of people who catch a cold and they start coughing after that. And we think about it as post URI asthma. Well, a lot of times it doesn't respond to bronchodilators um, except maybe anti-muscarinic because of the uh, vagal uh, irritant uh, receptor in the back of the throat and the lungs. So anyway, these folks that have these prolonged coughing episodes after they catch a cold, it's because every time you cough, you can spit, if you have this condition, you can spit a little reflux into the back of your throat that irritates the back of your throat, makes you cough more, which then triggers more reflux, which then triggers more coughing. And these poor people get into this cough reflux, cough 
cough reflux, cough reflux cycle that can go on for weeks and months after a cold that nobody knows what to do with. Uh, so again, a really good thing to be thinking about in that setting. Um, you know, I keep calling it reflux, reflux, but it's not GERD. That's just really, it's not GERD because it's not gastroesophageal reflux disease. The ENTs call it LPR, laryngopharyngeal reflux, but that's because they're mostly seeing people with hoarseness and vocal cord issues from this. One of my allergy fellows wanted to call it NPR for allergists, meaning nasopharyngeal reflux because it's got the nose, it's got the pharynx. Uh, people much smarter than me call it silent GERD or silent reflux because the patients um, don't necessarily have to have GERD. The vast majority have never felt heartburn. They just have this silent reflux. But I've tried to champion the acronym SERD, S-E-R-D, for supraesophageal reflux disease because it includes everything. It doesn't matter whether it's your nose, your sinuses, your throat, or your lungs. It's everything that's above the esophagus, which is your entire respiratory tract. And because patients, a lot of patients know the acronym GERD, it's even though Supra is out of their, their, their ballpark, it's just something they can latch onto because it's, it's sort of similar to GERD. But anyway, these are all the, the acronyms. Now, this slide is really complicated, and I don't think you can see my um, pointer, but the key thing starting from the top is GERD is heartburn. CERD may have some heartburn, but really these people may never have had it. This is really all the respiratory stuff. So they don't have esophagitis. So, you, so when somebody gets sent to a uh, GI and they get endoscoped and they say you don't have esophagitis and they say your symptoms aren't from reflux, well, of course, it's not from GERD reflux, it's LPR reflux. And why should they have esophagitis if they've never had GERD symptoms? Um, the other thing that's really interesting is if you look at this, it says supine reflux is the thing for GERD, but not the thing for CERD. I'll show you our data that it just turned this on a dime. Uh, why would people with LPR not have predominantly supine reflux? It makes no sense at all, right? When you're lying down, it's so much easier for the stuff to reflux up. But this was conventional wisdom because conventional wisdom was supine reflux is GERD. And since these people don't have GERD, they probably don't have supine reflux. But we actually published the data that shows they're wrong. The thing that's so amazing to me, one of the amazing, one of the many amazing things about this condition is the patients sleep like a baby. So I tell my patients there's another diagnostic feature. So again, the first diagnostic feature, intermittent hoarseness, because a lot of the signs and symptoms are nonspecific, you know, post-nasal drainage, throat clearing, eustachian tube dysfunction. But this intermittent hoarseness is really diagnostic. And then the fact that these people are coughing all the time, but they sleep like a baby, even though... 80% of them are doing either all or most of their refluxing at night. They sleep like a baby. They start to cough and throw clear all throughout the day. Think about other conditions that produce cough, chronic sinusitis, asthma, uh, congestive heart failure, pulmonary edema, you go, pneumonia. You go on and on and on for anything that produces a cough. And these people have horrible nights and can't wait for the day to start because they get a little bit of relief. These patients sleep like a baby but cough all day long. Um, so here's really the, the pathophysiology, like, you know, how can these people be having SERD and not GERD? Well, it turns out that in GERD, as you all know, you have a defect in your lower esophageal sphincter. It's relaxed and it allows reflux from, reflux really of stomach acid, and that's really critical, reflux of stomach acid into the lower esophagus. The brain perceives that as a burning sensation since the stomach's on the left side of your chest uh, body and the esophagus has to come over to the left side to meet it. Then where the reflux is, is right at the level of one's heart. So it feels like your heart's burning. That's, that's GERD. Um, people who have GERD alone have a good upper esophageal sphincter. People who have only LPR have a perfectly normal LES, but they have a bad UES, upper esophageal sphincter, that allows the normal amount of acid that everybody who walks the face of the earth has refluxing up into the lower esophagus, up into the back of their throat. So it turns out that the lower esophageal sphincter in the normal human is not a perfectly competent sphincter. It lets a little acid come up but the esophagus gets used to it. It has buffering capacity, it has peristalsis to push that acid back. So you have to get up above a certain level of acidity or a certain um, um, duration of acidity before it finally dawns on the brain that you have heartburn. But that normal amount of acid that doesn't cause GERD can get up into the throat if you have a defect in your UES. So that's how people get SERD without GERD. 
And obviously, if you have heartburn and LPR symptoms, you've got two bum sphincters. All right. So how do you make the diagnosis? There actually is a symptom questionnaire that was published years ago, um, and here, the reference is on this slide. And it looks at all the typical symptoms that I just mentioned, and then they rate it with numbers. And if you add up all the numbers according to this ENT practice, if you got a score of 13 total, that was highly suspicious and, and correlated statistically with LPR. But when you look at a lot of the symptoms, a lot of them are things that allergy patients have. So a few years ago with Kaiser and, and one of my allergy fellows, we actually did this in a huge group of people coming through both the Kaiser and the Scripps allergy clinics. And then we correlated that with documented LPR. And it turned out in an allergy clinic, it's actually 19 before you actually can say that those symptoms are related to LPR. But it's still a very easy, useful tool. And, and you see the, the publication there if you want to want to publish it. What about doing a barium swallow? Well, that's totally useless because it has nothing to do with reflux into the lower esophagus. So it's been shown to be very insensitive for LPR. What about doing a laryngeal exam, right? So you're wondering, this, this person has LPR, I'll go send them to ENT and see if they have any issues with their vocal cords. Well, the problem is you can do, or maybe you do naso, you know, rhinopharyngoscopy or nasopharyngoscopy. You may do that, but, and you may see inflammation in the area where the vocal cords are, but that's inflammation. What, the patient's been coughing for five years, 10 years, 20 years. Some patients that have coughing for 30 years, you would expect their vocal cords to be inflamed. If you have chronic sinusitis with post-nasal drip, you'll have inflamed vocal cords. If you're a singer, you can have inflamed vocal cords. There's so many reasons to have inflamed vocal cords. It's a nonspecific finding. It doesn't make it LPR. So what the ENTs look for, if, again, if you do rhinopharyngoscopy, you look for what they look for what's called um, edema or erythema or both of the retinoids. So this is a, a cartoon that shows it. This is a picture that shows it. Again, a nonspecific finding. These vocal cords look fine. It's just a little bit of edema, a little bit of erythema in the uh, retinoid area. Insufficient to make a diagnosis of SIRD. Um, there's a whole bunch of studies in the medical literature that have shown that you can't do laryngoscopy to diagnose this condition. There's incredible amount of inter-observer variability. Um, so this is just one of the studies. Uh, this is three other studies that show that it's just absolutely not diagnostic. And the reason is that there's actually another score that scores for the, the findings on nasopharyngoscopy. And if you look towards the top under erythema, you get a couple of points if your retinoids are erythematous. If you add a little bit of edema, you get another couple of points. But you need seven to make a 95% positive predictive value for LPR. You're only a two or three or four. You're, you're barely half of what you need for seven. So that's why you can't just, and, and, but so many ENTs just see that and say, yes, this patient has LPR. I've presented this data to, I can't tell you how many ENTs, and you know what they all tell me? They say, oh yeah, well the ones in the studies couldn't tell, but I, but I can tell. It's very clear from the studies and from this scoring that, that they can't. Um, so what about doing what, what I call a diagnostic therapeutic trial of, of medicine, right? We do that a lot in medicine. <clears throat> Well, if you do acid suppression, studies have shown that while the H2 receptor antagonists work great for GERD and maybe high dose um, uh, famotidine works great for COVID, we'll see, but really, really want to go to proton pump inhibitors for your diagnostic therapeutic trial. And most of the trials that have done this have done double dosing, so full dose, prescription dose, double dosing. And then the question is, how long do you do it for? So there are studies that say a couple of weeks, there are studies that say up to six months. In my experience, while it may take six months for somebody's horribly um, inflamed and, and, um, and, and damaged vocal cords to come back, um, within a month, you should be able to, the patient should be able to tell you that they're seeing improvement. And to me, if you see improvement with this, and nothing else has ever helped this patient before, intranasal steroids and antihistamines, and you go on and on and on, to me, that really makes the diagnosis. But the problem is if the patient doesn't respond, it doesn't mean they don't have SIRD because of non-acid reflux. I mentioned to you before that GERD is solely the reflux of acid, acid from, the lower, from the stomach into the lower esophagus. So if you suppress stomach acid, you're going to get improvement in GERD unless the patient's drinking orange juice, right? 
but this disease is more than just non-acid reflux. It's a true reflux disease. So um, anything, any partially digested food that's in your stomach is an issue. And also the enzyme pepsin is a major issue, but it's not for, for GERD. So you have to remember that there is, again, um, non acidic reflux that comes from the stomach, there's also pepsin. Pepsin, unfortunately, has this unique ability to attach to oropharyngeal cells. It's, just, it's an enzyme and attaches there and just really beats the crap out of them, if you will. What's so amazing is it can stay quiescent or inactive at a basic pH, say above 6.5 even, and the oropharynx is normally about 6.8. So it just sits there. But every time you drink something acidic, it reactivates and then starts causing symptoms. And there's a wide array of studies that show a wide array of inflammatory things that pepsin can do in terms of, you know, uh, cytokines and, and everything else. One other diagnostic thing, and I use this all the time, is that despite all these inflammatory cytokines that get activated, this is a non-steroid responsive disease. So if I see somebody who had allergies in their past, but, you know, it didn't bother them since they were a kid, and now as an adult, they've got typical LPR symptoms, but you do skin testing and you say, oh, my God, look at all these positive skin tests. Maybe it's allergy. I give them a burst of systemic steroids, and I tell them literally the percent of your symptoms that are allergic will be the percent response you get. And not infrequently, I get no response whatsoever because they had their allergies as a child. Those aren't causing their symptoms. They haven't caused their symptoms in a million years. They're in the same environment. Why should that be all of a sudden activated? It does nothing. And some patients, they go, yeah, you know, I'm better. And I say, well, are you, are you good enough? You know, is this good enough for you? And they say, yeah, okay, fine. I'll, I'll drop LPR and treat them as, as an allergic patient. But they go, yeah, I'm better, but like, this is not good. Oh, and again, most of the time it's like, I can't even tell there's any difference. Again, diagnostic that you're not dealing with allergy and most likely dealing with SIRD. All right, so what about doing an endoscopy? It should be pretty obvious from what I've said that endoscopies are going to be very of limited value because all they look for is esophagitis. But man, if you don't even have heartburn, you don't even get GERD symptoms at all, how in the world are you going to have uh, esophagitis? Those are for people that have totally uncontrolled heartburn. So that's just not going to work. Um, okay, so let's do pH monitoring, right? That's the thing to do because we're saying that, the, again, at least acid is a marker of the disease, even though pepsin may be a big culprit, even though partially digested food may be part of the problem. But acid is part of the problem, so you should be able to do pH monitoring and see. Well, the problem is where the heck do you put your probe? If you put it in the um, distal esophagus where most of these probes go, that's not where the reflux is happening. That, they're gonna, that's going to be a normal study. You could put it in the proximal esophagus, but you're still in the esophagus. You're, you're below the LES. You could put it in dual probes. That's what really everybody's doing these days, but you're still below the LES. Um, so you what about a pharyngeal probe? Well, those are good, but they tend to get all gummed up by mucus, and they get dried out of somebody's mouth breathing because they, they've got congestion in their nose. So it turns out that the, the way that I do it, and the only really way that you can do it, is with oropharyngeal pH monitoring. So this is the typical thing that GIs do, the Bravo capsule, the patient, uh, they put it into the patient's esophagus, um, and, and then it's, it's monitored uh, remotely. It's, it's very cool for GERD. You can put it way down at the distal esophagus. You can see that at the bottom right. You could do a proximal uh, esophagus. You could do both. But again, it's, it's not where, you, where the money is, and the pharyngeal probe is a problem. So um, this, this cartoon shows, you know, an esophageal probe way down towards the distal esophagus, um, but it's too low to detect LPR. You can put the second channel a bit higher up, but that it dries up if it's above the level of the LES in, in this typical Bravo thing. Um, the sensors can get all fouled up by mucus. Um, yeah, the mucus can actually mask a reflux event if it happened. So it really, it's great, great for GERD, just doesn't work for SIRD. So not surprisingly, there's all sorts of studies that show that there's a lot of variability in, in the measuring. And, and even the, the proximal pH probe, which has a sensitivity of 91%, it has really poor sensitivity and reproducibility, even though the specificity is good. Um, there's a lot of day-to-day -day variation. So this is what the patient winds up getting into. Um, PCP or, you, or we refer them to ENT. ENT says, oh yeah, look at the edema in the retinoids, look at the erythema in the retinoids, I'm gonna put you on uh, reflux treatment. What's the reflux treatment? 20 milligrams of omeprazole. 
You could do that until the cows come home. It's not going to work. Even if they do 40 milligrams of omeprazole twice a day, it may not work because it's not acidic reflux. But they think it's reflux. They send them to a GI. What does the GI do? They do an upper endoscopy, and they don't see esophagitis. They say it can't be reflux. So what does the patient do then? They're frustrated. It goes back to PCP. Maybe they get referred to us. We do skin testing. Maybe we find positives, treat them for allergy. It doesn't work. Maybe we find negatives and tell them it's not allergy. Go see somebody else. It's crazy. Patients have nowhere to go. I call this an orphan disease. It's an orphan disease that nobody wants to treat. The ENTs really don't want to treat it because they're surgeons. The GIs don't know anything about the respiratory tract, and they don't think it's reflux because their upper endoscopy is negative. Chest, chest, chest physicians see these patients all the time because they're coughing, but once they realize after they do methacholine challenges and chest CTs and this ridiculous expensive workup, they finally conclude that the, the cough is coming from the back of their throat, and they're not throat doctors. The, so it's just so frustrating for the patients. So I say I call it an orphan disease, and I really think that we allergists need to adopt this disease because we don't care what organ it's in. We don't care what the mechanism is. We just treat things. You know, we treat skin. We treat respiratory tract. We should be treating this disease. All right. So, yeah, so LPR can exist independent of GERD, and I, I gave you some reasons why in terms of the mechanism of the LES and the UES but also because of pepsin, really, really important, the fact that it can be reactivated in an acidic environment. Um, but remember that the esophagus can handle this stuff because it has peristalsis. It has the ability to bicarbonate buffer things. The poor larynx is completely unprepared for this, so a little bit goes a long way in terms of symptom production. So again, as allergists, what do we do? We're detectives. We try to figure out what's going on, and we, we, then we just deal with it. So that's what I do in, with these patients. So this is oropharyngeal pH monitoring. Uh, this is really the only way that you can really diagnose this condition, and, and I really suggest that, that allergists adopt this procedure. Um, you know, we're seeing less and less real allergy because of everything that's OTC, um, and having another condition to treat, I think, is really good. So, so the equipment is on the left. Um, this little tube that's coming out of the tiny bottle with the yellow fluid is what actually goes into the patient's nose, straight into the patient's nose, not up into their sinuses, and not down and not through their mouth, down into the back of their throat here, where the where the gag reflux would be. It goes along the floor of the nose and winds up right at the level of the uh, tip of the uvula. That's where you want this probe. So this is what it looks like when it's in a patient's throat, although I usually pull it back just a little bit so I don't see it anymore because a lot of patients, uh, it either tickles their uvula or, or they, they gag a little bit. So I usually just pull it back just a hair so I can't see it anymore. And then as the tube comes out of the patient's nose, there's a clear piece of tape that goes over the tube to hold it in place. And then at the end of the tube, there's a little blue thing. That little blue thing is a radio transmitter that um, goes into a pouch that clips onto the patient's collar or dress or blouse or whatever. And then that transmits all the data to a receiver or a recorder that you can wear on the belt or leave on your nightstand overnight because it'll pick up from 10 or 15 feet away. And it is continuously monitoring acid, just absolutely continuously. Um, so this, this has been shown, that, and, and there's all sorts of normative data, you know, in terms of what makes a, a positive test, and, and you know, there's no reason to go over that now, but there's very clear data as, as to what's a positive test. These are examples of some of, of the tests that I've done. So up on the top is a perfectly normal pH probe test. If you look on the left side, the graph is the, the Y ordinate is, is actually the pH. And then along the um, X ordinate, you're dealing with um, time. The recorder has some buttons. You see little colors at the bottom. There's a little blue, a little pink, and then a big red line. Well, those are either symptom buttons or they're meal buttons or something else, but the red line is sleep. So you can precisely see when the patient went to sleep, follow that red line until it falls again, and that's when they woke up. So that's their interval of sleep. This is a perfectly normal curve. You can see it's 7.5 or somewhere between 7 and, and 7 and, and 8 the whole entire time. <clears throat> if you look at B, and you look where sleep is, you'll see that there's um, pH getting down to almost 4.5 early on. It gets down to about 4.5 before they, um, even like way before they go to bed. It gets down to 4.5 before they go to bed. 
But then for some reason, when they go supine, it, it normalizes. But that doesn't really help them because it gets down to five in the middle of the night. It gets down to 4.5 just before they wake up. And then you see when they wake up, it just shoots back up to normal again. But it falls again before the probe actually comes out. So this is both upright and supine LPR. Now, C is solely uh, supine LPR. If you look anywhere where you don't see the red bar, it's absolutely normal pH. But once they go to bed, it gradually falls and falls and falls and falls until it reaches a nadir of 4.5. Now, you'll see that it shoots up again in the middle of the night before they actually wake up. Guess what that is? patient got up to pee. <laughs> and once they assumed an upright posture, it normalized, had a little trouble falling back to bed, finally fell back to bed, and it shot right back down again because they were supine. But the moment, the very moment that they got up in the morning, it shot up to normal again because this is solely only supine reflux, the most common pattern. The rarest pattern is D. Somehow, this patient defies the laws of gravity and is only refluxing when they're supine. Uh, I, I still don't know how that happens, but this is a, a very, very rare pattern. So here's the numbers. We did 235 tests. If you remember what I said early on in this talk, everybody assumed that this was a, an, a supine, sorry, an upright disease because they don't have GERD. Well, 55% of the patients had supine reflux only. 42% of the patients had supine plus orthostatic reflux, but it was clearly much worse when they were supine. So 96% of the patients have supine reflux, completely opposite what people thought before this study, and only 4% have purely upright, ref uh, yeah, upright, upright reflux. So when, when, when we got this data, when one of our fellows and I, Dave Scott, and I got this um, uh, data, I wondered, what happens if you elevate the head of the bed? So we did that. We took people who had solely supine reflux, 13 people, had them sleep with the head of the bed elevated six inches and repeated the study. And in 10 of the 13, almost 80%, there was either complete clearing or dramatic improvement in the LPR. Now, that was just one night sleeping that way. So we don't know whether or not their symptoms were going to get better, but I sure think they w will and would have. And, you know, that's um, 10 out of 13 getting either significant improvement or, or um, complete, but eight out of those 10 were total complete resolution of the, N of the L NPR, LPR with six inches head of the bed elevation. I mean, you're, t you're talking about completely changing somebody's life with just changing that. Now, it's not easy for a back sleeper to do that. Um, it's, it's, sorry, a side sleeper to do that. So there are some issues with it, but I mean, if the patient's amenable, it's so easy to do if that's what the data suggests. All right, so I'm going to move on. Um, if you have somebody who has really bad GERD, but you're also wondering, do they have SIRD, but you don't want to pull them off their PPIs to do the oropharyngeal pH monitoring that I just showed you, some GIs have something that they call esophageal plethysmography or esophageal impedance manometry, and they can actually look at the, the waves of the esophagus and show that there's retrograde flow, meaning reflux, even if people stay on their proton pump inhibitors. So I use that when I have somebody that has uh, bad GERD and they really just don't want to go off their PPIs for the five days or even seven days that it takes to get normalized again. All right, so what do you do about the condition? So a lot of lifestyle changes, right? You want to avoid large meals. Certainly, you want to avoid a large dinner meal, and you really want to avoid eating anything. I have so many patients that have a little snack, little cookies and milk before they go to bed. Well, then you can get um, partially digested food reflux. If all that's in your stomach is acid and a little bit of pepsin, then maybe overnight acid suppression could be helpful. But if there's food in your stomach, it's going to be make it make it more difficult. We've all heard that spicy or acidic foods make reflux worse. Well, they don't make reflux worse. It's just that they make the symptoms of reflux worse because if something really acidic or spicy refluxes up, it's going to be more irritating than something that's not. Carbonated beverages are horrible. Many of them are caffeinated, and caffeine, alcohol, and nicotine lower the uh, lower esophageal sphincter uh, tone. The, car the carbonation is acid, so if it refluxes up, it's acidic. And the bubbles distend our stomach, and we belch, so you get more reflux. So they're horrible. Uh, weight loss is good, especially if you have supine reflux, so you don't have your stomach and pushing your diaphragm up into your neck when you go to bed. Um, it turns out completely non-intuitively to me that sleeping in the left lateral decubitus position is the best. I, I would have not imagined that, but it is. 
Now, there aren't any randomized clinical trials on any of this, but it just makes good sense, and clearly patients respond. I don't know if you ever heard of something called alginate, but alginate is the ingredient that is in the over-the-counter Gaviscon um, antacid. So Gaviscon is like every other antacid. It's got you know, malo- uh, like a malox agent, uh, magnesium hydroxide, aluminum hydroxide, whatever. But it has this thing, alginate. And when alginate gets into the stomach, it produces a gel. They call it a raft. Sometimes I call it foam. That's lighter than liquid, so it comes up to the top of the stomach and tries to act like a physical barrier to reflux, which so truly are an anti-reflux agent. You know, all the PPIs in the world are not anti-reflux. We call them reflux drugs. They do nothing for reflux. They just reduce the amount of acid that you make, so there's less acid to reflux up. So this is really the only non-surgical treatment that actually is, a, is an anti-reflux treatment. It's really rapidly acting. People, people can take it after each meal, certainly take one before they go to bed. Who knows how long it lasts? I have people take it again if they wake up in the middle of the night for some reason. Relatively inexpensive, no known side effects. There is one randomized clinical trial that showed that it worked. Um, acid depression, I think we've talked a lot about. Um, I'm not going to get into it. It's like almost a whole talk on its own. Um, The results have been mixed, as you can imagine, because, again, it's not only acid that is refluxing, right, so that the results are mixed. What about a prokinetic agent, right? If you can tighten up the sphincters, that would be great. Well, the problem is that a lot of our patients are taking things that decrease LES pressure. So let's look at that first. So anticholinergics can do it. Tricyclic antidepressants can do it. Gee, I wonder how many of our patients are on beta adrenergics but also calcium channel blockers can do it. So I always look at the medicines they're on and see if I can make some substitutions. Now, we probably all heard about metoclopramide or or Reglan. The problem is that it doesn't actually work very well on the LES, and it also tightens every other muscle in the GI tract, so patients have a lot of trouble with side effects. But the biggest issue is tardive dyskinesia has been associated with it, so um, it's really something that people just don't want to prescribe. I do personally. It works in some patients, and it's kind of a last resort. And I really do feel that the um, tardive dyskinesia is both a duration but also a very dose-correlated thing. But, again, that's just my feelings about it. The the bigger problem with metoclopramide is we think that a lot of patients with LPR have this thing that's called, get ready for this, an exaggerated transient relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, So what that means, the way I explain this to patients is, wouldn't it be nice if every time we swallowed, a signal would go to the LES to relax just a little bit, just start to relax a little bit so when the food or liquid got there, the poor esophagus didn't have to pry open the LES and, and get the food or liquid to plop down into the stomach. Well, sure enough, there is. There's a reflex that's called reflex that's called transient relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter, believe it or not, TRLES. Well, a number of patients with GERD and therefore a number of patients with LPR have an exaggerated transient relaxation of their lower esophageal sphincter and I believe also their upper esophageal sphincter and metoclopramide can actually work on that and there and uh, metoclop um, sorry not metoclopramide Met- metoclopramide can't work on that but baclofen can work on that um, it's just a GABA agonist um, used for a gazillion other things um, but it can actually be used for LPR and there's actually a, a number of GERD studies that have shown it works. Um, and there's I, there definitely and there's a um, LPR study. Well, there, there are studies that show that it does work on the LES. Um, and there are people in the field, in this field of LPR, that feel that it does a good job for LPR. Um, I've used it in a number of patients. It's not been as great as I've hoped it would be, but again, I do have patients in whom it works. I have some patients who metoclopramide works. Those are sort of the only anti-reflux medicines that we have. All right, so if you go through all of that, you know, at some point I think you really should consider the pH monitoring, but not esophageal pH monitoring. Think about what, the, the, what I showed you. Um, but because if, if nothing else is going on, you've got to think about surgery, and it's a pretty big leap to tell somebody who's throat clearing that they got to go have surgery on their esophagus. So you certainly want pH monitoring to confirm that. Um, surgery can be um, a, a big decision, obviously, for patients. Some patients just want to do it. I can't tell you how many patients I've seen who've been coughing for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. When they come to see me, they call me their last resort. They say, Dr. Simon, I've seen everybody else. Everybody says, you can figure things out. I'm here for my cough. If you can figure it out, I will do anything you tell me to do. 
And when I do the pH monitoring, tell them that it's reflux and all the different things I want them to do, they go, you know, I'm not going to do anything. I think I'll just live with it. And I go, like, what are you talking about? You told me you would do anything I say. Uh, you've been coughing for 30 years, and I don't want to do anything about it. And they go, well, you know, it wasn't really bothering me. It was bothering everybody else. People think I had, you know, COVID, God forbid. People think I have TB, I have cancer, I have whatever. Now that I know that it's, quote, unquote, just reflux, I'll live with it. And I tell them it's okay. You know, there's, there's no problem. You want to live with it, go live with it. Um, you know, because there are obviously risks of surgery, and it doesn't work in, in everybody. But if you do the surgery, it can be the traditional Nissen, or uh, rather than this toupee. The toupee was, was meant to be um, sort of a slightly looser Nissen, so there's less issues with actually getting food back into the esophagus if you make a Nissen too tight. But the problem is, since this is really a, a, a UES problem in somebody that doesn't have GERD more than an LES problem, if you don't tighten the LES enough, it's not going to work. So it really has to be a Nissen, but it's really a very delicate balance between how tight you make it, because if you make it too tight, the patient won't be able to swallow and eat. If you leave it a little too loose, they could still be getting LPR. Um, so not surprisingly, there's various, various results with surgery. Not everybody is happy with it. Some patients, and also it's not necessarily that long lasting. There are some, some studies that have shown that after 10 or 20 years, 40% of the GERD patients are back on PPIs. Almost 20% have had to have a repeat procedure. Um, again, the expertise of the surgeon is huge. Um, unfortunately, academic centers having, you know, um, fellows and residents do surgery may not get you the results that you want. Um, it, 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 but really, it's really how many procedures the person has done. And, and really, they have to understand the difference between LES and UES and GERD versus SERD. And, and you really have to have a conversation with the surgeon about that. But they still don't want to get a bad outcome, meaning the patient can't swallow food. So what is really promising is this Lynx reflex management system. Um, there's a great article in 2013, New England Journal of Medicine, got unbelievable results in GERD. It is just these little titanium beads, each that has a magnet inside that are strung together with a piece of wire. And you basically do, uh, you do the same surgical procedure. You go down to the LES, you put this, this string of, of magnets around the LES, tie them together, and now you've got a ring of magnets, and the ring of magnets contract. It's perfect. Um, it's a really easy procedure. It can be reversed if the patient doesn't like it. This New England Journal article had virtually 100% um, success rate in GERD. They had no SIR data, but I called the company and they said that they definitely have had any number of anecdotal reports that it works just as well in LPR. My LPR patients love this thing if you can get it from their insurance companies. It's not um, Medicare approved, so that's a little bit difficult. Um, the one downside, the one theoretical potential downside is that in, initially MRIs were contraindicated. Um, MRIs, if, I don't know if you know, come in different levels of power, power of the magnet. They go from a T1 magnet, the weakest, all the way up to a T3 magnet, and, and different uh, organ systems get different levels of MRIs. Anyway, um, the first generation device, you really couldn't get any kind of an MRI in the abdomen, but with the second generation device, you could actually get a T1, even a T2 uh, MRI, just not a T3 MRI in the abdomen. You can get your shoulder, your head, your knees, your whatever is done. It's just really an abdominal one, even chest really is just abdominal, but that's an issue. So this is what it looks like on a cartoon. This is actually one that got tied together. So something really, I think, pretty cool. I don't know if you've seen this, if your patients have come to you with this, a RISA band, um, it's supposed to be, ready for this, a, a, a upper, upper esophageal a sphincter assist device, put a little, give a little extra pressure to the upper esophageal sphincter. Unfortunately, there's only like one study with it, and it's uncontrolled in an open access journal, so I don't know how really well it works, but again, it, there's sort of no downside to trying it. I haven't had a single patient that wanted to get one of these yet, though. All right, so um, again, think about the patient's quality of life issues. They may just want to live with it, and that's okay. They may want, may want to try something really simple like that Reza band. Okay, so I'm pretty much done. Just remember, again, if you see patients who are coughing and throat clearing, have post-nasal drip, um, you know, think about SIRD, even if they don't have GERD. Um, they get globus sensation. So when it's really interesting, another diagnostic science, I'm going to do this again for repetition purposes. So the three diagnostic signs just by taking a history is, again, laryngitis that comes and goes. Um, sorry, I forgot the second one, actually. Oh, sorry. Um, but anyway, the third one is, is when they say they have postnasal drip and you say, show it to me, you know, spit some up. I want to see it. They can't. 
where if you have somebody with chronic sinusitis, they can. They can spit up all the crap that you want to see because these people really have a globus sensation. But, boy, if you tell a doc I, I feel something in the back of my throat and ENT doesn't see it, your next referral is to psychiatry. So I don't want to talk about a globus sensation. So they talk about a post-nasal drip, but there's nothing there. It's a diagnostic sign. Even though they say 24-7 they're coughing up mucus, um, they're not doing it 24 hours. That's the second thing. They sleep like a baby, even though they say it's 24 hours. They have intermittent laryngitis, and they have this quote-unquote post-nasal drainage that isn't really there. So think silent reflux. Think about the acceptable lifestyle changes that your patient's willing to do, like head of the bed elevation, um, you know, avoiding the late-night meals, the avoiding alcohol and caffeine if they have um, you know, uh, upright reflux, the alginate and the gabascon. Think about a PPI trial. Uh, all of the above, and, and even surgery. So I was asked to give you the word of the day. It's masquerade. And I am ready for questions. This is uh, the Toy Pines Golf Course in the middle, the Pacific Ocean in the background, and uh, the Scripps uh, main campus in the foreground. But in case people want to see the word of the day, I'll go back to that. Ron, this is Len. Thanks very much. Uh, for an excellent talk. You hear me? Yeah, yeah. So I have a question. Um, I don't understand the, the monitoring that you showed us, the upper airway or the high. Since this is not always acidic, you've told us pepsin is important, that this could be non-acidic reflux, but you're only measuring the pH with that device. So how is that helpful? Yeah, yeah. So, so um, th thanks for asking that because I, I tried to make the point, but I, I easily could have uh, missed it. Or, or anyway, so so acid is obviously refluxing up. So I use acid as the marker for the fact that there's reflux. It's the surrogate marker for the fact that there's reflux, even though treating it isn't necessarily effective, although it is in some patients, because again, this is a pure reflux disease. So pepsin and partially digested food coming up can also trigger the symptoms, but acid can as well, and it's the surrogate marker. So you'd have to do this test with them off of PPIs. Yeah, that's the problem. But again, so many of the patients don't have GERD, so it's not an issue. They're not even on them. Sometimes they come referred to me through ENT or PCP, and they're on it because somebody got the idea. Maybe it's reflux, and you do have to stop it. Um, and, and if you're going to do that, and somebody's been on high-dose, prescription-dose, double-dose, twice-a-day PPI, please don't stop it cold turkey because there's a huge break on acid production uh, by the brain. The brain is sending really strong, okay, there's a really strong break on acid suppression with PPIs. The brain isn't happy and it's sending really strong signals to make acid, but the stomach can't. The moment you take the break away, i.e. stop the double dose PPIs, there's this huge rebound hyperacidity that gives reflux even in people that have never felt reflux and give horrible reflux to people that have had reflux. So if they've been on prescription, especially double dose PPIs, I usually go down from two a day to one a day about 10 days before and then stop the other one five days before. Okay, good. Well, let's open it up to everybody for questions. Dr. Simon, hi, this is Greg Davis. I'm a uh, really appreciate your talk. I'm a otolaryngologist, was at the University of Washington for 13 years and just moved to private practice. Uh, I learned quite a bit and especially on the treatment of LPR and reflux. So thank you for that. I did just want to point out from an ENT's perspective, the benefits of laryngoscopy. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, maybe I'll challenge your comment that laryngoscopy has limited utility, but frequently these patients will present to the ENT's office with throat clearing, chronic cough, and hoarseness. And really the, the goal of the ENT is to make sure nothing bad is going on. And really the only way to do that is with a flexible laryngoscopy, just to make sure there's not a lesion on the cords or in the glottis. Uh, and, and yes, I, you, you know, our, our academy recommends anybody with hoarseness for greater than four weeks to have a laryngoscopy. That's our clinical practice guideline. Um, and I agree, it is challenging often to see mild or even moderate reflux in the interretinoid area. Um, certainly severe reflux is pretty easy to see, but uh, 
again, just want to make that comment that if, if a provider does have a patient with chronic hoarseness, that's the utility of getting them in to see an ENT. Thank you. Yeah, oh, no, you're absolutely right. Thanks for the comment. And I do refer to ENT all the time, just to make sure, again, there's not a vocal cord polyp or worse. Um, I was really totally speaking about the diagnostic capability in terms of making a diagnosis of LPR. Like you said, when it's mild, you really can. So yeah, thanks for, thanks for clarifying that. Other questions, folks? We've got uh, over 30 people out there. <laughs> I suspect we've all been seeing this and uh, not known it, not handled it well. And people do go around in a circle. We skin test them, they're negative. We send them to ENT and so on. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's incredibly common. Um, Again, especially in a population above age 50. Um, and, you know, why it is, I don't know. I tell patients that, you know, as you're getting older, everything sort of gets looser. Why, should, why shouldn't the LES or the UES get looser? But it's amazing how many times there's some seminal event uh, that the patient then comes in about uh, or, or somebody will finally say to them, I'm just tired of listening to you clear your throat or cough so they come in. Uh, but when you go back to the history, you'll find out that it's been way before it got to be a real problem. Uh, for decades, they've been throat clearing and nobody really thought much above it, about it. Uh, it really is very common. You know, again, it, you say, well, how serious is that? Well, you know, how serious is having a runny nose or sneezing that we see with allergy? It's just like it's a disease that's just made for allergists to do something about the quality of life changes or what we, what we live for in, in allergic disease. And uh, you can make a huge change in somebody's quality of life. What do you think, what percentage of people with chronic cough uh, have this diagnosis? Yeah, it's so hard to say because, you know, we, everybody who sees them has a skewed population, you know, so in an allergist office, there are other reasons for coughing and the ENT office is other reasons for coughing. Um, when we when we did that that study where we were looking at the symptom score and we were trying to that's why we we had to go from a score of, of you know 13 in an ENT office where as the, the the doctor said you know they see a lot of larynx problems uh, we had to go all the way up to 19 in an allergist office because we tend to see a lot of other upper upper respiratory tract complaints but because it also can complicate allergy right the two aren't mutually exclusive um, as you get into an older population I mean it's it's a it's a lot of patients, I, and I can't give you a, a quarter, a third, a half, but it really should be on your mind. You know, I, I had to kind of train or, or lecture and, and explain to fellows and my own colleagues about this condition, and now on a regular basis, they're referring me people to have this pH pro. I, I do um, several a day, most days of the week. And um, again, it's a high suspicion, but these are patients coming right out of the allergy clinic and a very high percentage of them wind up having it. But it's also really important, again, if they don't have it, because then you don't have to worry about giving them PPI trials and lifestyle trials and do all this other stuff. So again, I think having this as a, in your tool belt, just like you have all these other tools in your tool belt, is, is, is hugely powerful um, because you can make the diagnosis or not make the diagnosis. And then you also determine uh, the pattern. You know, the pattern is really important because if it is only supine, then you can give a trial of head of the bed elevation or do what I do, which is repeat the study and see if there's even any point in doing a month's worth of a head of the bed elevation. Well, from everybody up here in Seattle, let me thank you, Ron. How are things down there? Things are pretty good. You know, as you probably know, California, I think, like Washington, did a pretty good job of uh, social distancing and flattening the curve. So we're beginning to uh, loosen up on things a bit. It's interesting. Um, it's a tale of two parts of the county, if you will. Unfortunately, uh, here in San Diego, Tijuana is basically going through what New York went through a few weeks ago. And a number of those patients are kind of bleeding up across the border. So our South County hospitals have more cases per hospital than the rest of the county's hospitals put together. All right, well, um, stay well. Any last questions? No, no, I think I, I covered a lot of, uh, of little things that 